So nowadays we open face with data sets collected from multiple sources. And uh, we need to jointly analyze these data sets and extract interpretable patterns from such multimodal data sets. So in this talk, we will discuss how to capture the underlying patterns in complex data with the goal of extracting novel insights. And we rely on tensor factorizations and their extensions to multiple data sets. So we will discuss these methods, applications from different fields, challenges, and also the ongoing progress. Now let's start with why we are interested in jointly analyzing data from multiple sources. So in order to understand complex systems such as the brain or the human metabolome, we often need to collect both time evolving and static data sets and jointly analyze these data sets, find the underlying patterns and also understand how those patterns change in time. So here is an example uh, where we are interested in understanding differences among subjects in terms of their metabolic response to a meal challenge test. So here participants drink a diet or shake and every half an hour or so their blood samples are taken. And then these blood samples are measured using an analytical technique to detect the metabolites, metabolites in the blood. So we have this participant by metabolite by time array. So through the analysis of this data set, we want to find the underlying patterns in the metabolized mode to see which met metabolites act together. We want to understand how they change in time and also whether these patterns can reveal differences among groups of subjects. So in addition to the dynamic data, we also often have additional sources of information, such as uh, gene expression data, gut microbiome data, which may also be relevant in terms of understanding the metabolic differences among individuals. So analysis of these data sets is important because if we have the methods and the tools uh, to reveal stratifications of the subjects, then we can also use this information for precision nutrition and medicine. So basically our goal is to jointly analyze dynamic and static data sets, find underlying patterns in an interpretable way, and then also understand how some of the patterns change in time. There are no such models, so we will try to formulate this, and we will rely on coupled matrix and tensor factorizations. So before discussing coupled models, let's briefly go over matrix factorizations uh, and tensor factorizations. So in data mining, we often use matrix factorizations to find the underlying patterns in data sets. So if we have, for instance, user by word or term matrix, where each entry indicates the number of times a specific word is by, uh, used by a certain user, we can factorize this matrix and then use the extracted factors to find the topics being discussed in the data and the groups of users talking about these topics. But in applications, we often have multi-way data, data with more than two axes of variation. So in addition to user and word, we can also take into account the time information and arrange the data as a user by uh, term by time array. This is a three-way array, also referred to as a third order tensor. And tensor factorizations have proved useful to uh, analyze in terms of analyzing and uh, analyzing such higher order data sets and finding the underlying patterns. So if we analyze this data using a tensor model, we can find the conversations going on in the data. And now more and more in uh, many applications, we come across with data from different sources. So in the application uh, that uh, I showed in the beginning, we're interested in omics data fusion. In uh, neuroscience, we're often interested in analyzing neuroimaging signals from multiple modalities. And here, an effective way is to formulate the problem as a coupled uh, matrix tensor factorization problem. Now, let's discuss matrix factorizations and tensor factorizations a bit more in detail, because when we uh, get to the coupled models, uh, we will build on to these. So given a sample by variable matrix X, we can factorize it as A times B transpose. And here, the columns of B may correspond to the underlying patterns, and then each row of A may indicate how much each pattern contributes to the measurements of a sample. And by imposing different constraints on these factor matrices, we can formulate this as singular value decomposition, non-negative matrix factorization, or independent component analysis. So let's take the example we had before, user by term matrix. We can find its best rank P approximation here using SVD. Uh, where we factorize x as u times sigma times v transpose. u and v have orthonormal columns corresponding to left and right singular vectors, and u has 
uh, is a diagonal matrix with the singular values on the diagonal. Now here we can use these left and right singular vectors to find the user groups and the topics uh, in the data. And we already saw uh, several times this week uh, in at least two talks that uh, mentioned that matrix factorizations are not unique. So we need constraints like we have in uh, SVD if we want to get uh, the underlying patterns uniquely. Otherwise, uh, if we can factorize X as A times B transpose, we can multiply A with a non-singular matrix M, multiply uh, B with the transpose of M inverse, and we will get a different but an equally good factorization of the same data. But sometimes in applications, we're interested in finding these patterns A and B uniquely, so we impose constraints. But if the constraints do not match um, make sense in terms of the application, then uh, we will not be able to find the true patterns. And this is uh, an example that you saw yesterday, but I think it won't hurt to repeat. So let's say we have these two matrices, A and B, and each has two columns. And let's say these columns here make sense in terms of your application. So we construct X as A times B transpose. So now X is a 201 by 61 matrix. Now, suppose we don't know A and B, we, we are only given X and we want to find these patterns. And these patterns may be important because looking at them, you may be able to identify a chemical. Now, what we can do here is we can use SVD. And if you use SVD, uh, we get two non-zero singular values, which is nice because given a 200 by 60 matrix, you immediately see that there are already two potentially interesting patterns. But then when we look at the corresponding singular vectors, this is what we get. So this is an example where uh, the constraints you impose may not make sense in terms of the uh, underlying patterns uh, you're looking for. So, so far we have one matrix, uh, which was X. So let's say X sub one is A times the identity times B transpose. Uh, what if we have another matrix? So it has the same A and B, but now the columns are scaled differently. So if we not, analyze these data sets together, then we can find the underlying patterns uniquely without the need to impose strong constraints like uh, orthogonality or statistical independence on the columns of A and B. So that takes us to tensor factorizations. As an extension of matrix factorizations to higher order data sets, we use tensor factorizations to find the underlying patterns in higher order data. We are mainly interested in uh, the tensor model called uh, canonical decomposition, parallel factor analysis, uh, canonical polyadic decomposition, we call it simply the CP model here. The CP model represents the tensor as the sum of minimum number of rank one terms. So when we fit an R component CP model to a third order tensor, we write the tensor as the sum of uh, R third order rank one terms. And here A, B, C correspond to the factor matrices in each mode and each has R columns. Now we can also write this model in this form, which says that every slice of the tensor has the same A and B, and then we have this diagonal matrix in the middle. So remember what we saw on the previous slide, so this is pretty much uh, saying that if we have such slices, and if we model the data using a CP model, then we can find these A, B, C uniquely, uh, unique up to permutation and scaling ambiguities without uh, strong constraints on the columns of the factor matrices. Now let's see several applications of this model uh, to understand how we can use this model to extract insights from the data. Here we have metabolomics measurements of plasma samples collected during uh, a meal challenge test from a group of participants. After an overnight fasting, participants drink a dietary shake, and then their blood samples are taken at certain time points for the next four hours. So the data is in the form of a subject by metabolite by time tensor. We model this tensor using a two component CP model here. So let's see what the, the components reveal. So this is the first rank one component. And then here you see the first component, A1, B1, C1. Then this is the second component, A2, B2, C2. In the subjects mode, subjects are colored according to their BMI group, lower BMI or higher BMI. In the metabolites mode, metabolites are colored according to the lipoprotein uh, Classes. So we see HDL, LDL, VLDL in different uh, colors here. And then in the time mode, we see the temporal profile. 
So here, potentially, the second component is interesting because we see a statistically significant uh, difference in terms of BMI. So in the metabolite mode, the, fact, the factor says that uh, this difference may be due to the subgroups of VLDLs behaving differently. So we have one subgroup of VLDL containing uh, large VLDLs, very large VLDLs, and extremely large VLDLs, positively related to the high BMI group. And then we have another subgroup which contains mainly the smaller ones, uh, negatively related to the high BMI group. And Similarly, we can uh, we can find the other important metabolites here with high coefficients. And then we also get the temporal profile. So here, this is an example of how we can use these patterns to understand the, uh, understand the differences in the response of the different subject groups. And one interesting finding here is that if you look at the data at time uh, T0, that's the fasting state, all the VLDLs, they positively relate to the high BMI group. And in the dynamic part, we see that subgroups behave differently. And that's not something that's visible uh, in the fasting state. So we need to analyze the dynamic data to, uh, to, see, that, uh, to see that pattern. OK, so this, this is one of the most recent applications of this model uh, that we have been working on. And then um, this is one of the first applications of the CP model that I worked on many years ago. So here we have multi-channel EEG signals collected during an epileptic seizure, and the goal is to localize the seizure origin. And we have the signals in a time domain here. We take a signal from a single channel, use continuous wave transform represented in both time and frequency domain. So that forms a slice of a tensor. We take another uh, uh, signal from another channel, form another slice of a tensor. And when we take into account the signals from all channels, we have this third order tensor with modes, time, frequency, and channels. Now we model this data using the CP uh, model. And let's see what the first component reveals about the data. It's modeling. So the first component is modeling an activity that occurs um, from time to time during the seizure period. It has low frequency content and it takes place at the frontal lobe. And after the analysis, this is identified as an eye artifact. And the second component is modeling an activity that occurs during the whole seizure period. It has high frequency content and it takes place at the right temporal lobe. And this is identified as the seizure component. So even though EEG does not have high spatial resolution, still this uh, factor vector that we extract from the channel mode gives us an idea about the seizure origin. So here's another application from uh, recommender systems that we worked on. Uh, where we have bibliometric data, uh, that where we arrange the data as an altered by conference uh, by year tensor. Each entry in the tensor indicates the number of papers published by an author uh, at a certain conference in a specific year. So by using the TP model, we can get a compact summary of the data. So for instance, one component may say, these authors publish at these conferences with an increasing trend in time. And then we may have uh, another component showing the, these authors publishing at these conferences every other year. And these are the conferences that were held every other year. So in addition to this compact summary, what we can also get uh, through this model is we can use the, the factors in the time mode and also use time series analysis methods to predict the next point in time so that we can predict who, who is going to publish at which conference uh, next year or who is going to buy which product or uh, who is going to uh, visit with web page. Okay, so there are many applications. It's not possible to, to cover all the applications here, but I also want to very briefly uh, mention this recent uh, interesting application from another group. Here, gut microbiome data is collected over time from infants during their early, uh, uh, early, uh, early life. And, um, the data is in the form of a subject by feature by time tensor. And then it's modeled using a CP model. And then the subject mode factors are used to group the subjects according to their birth mode, so natural versus C-section. And then in the feature mode, uh, one can see the microbial signature of the, the birth modes. Okay, so hopefully now uh, we are uh, all on the same page almost in terms of uh, how to use these methods, uh, matrix intensive factorizations. 
for finding underlying patterns in an interpretable way uh, from different types of data sets. So let's uh, move on to the real focus of our research, where we are interested in jointly analyzing dynamic and static data sets and uh, finding uh, the underlying patterns and also how those patterns evolve in time. So here we face uh, both modeling and algorithmic challenges. So the first set of challenges is due to data fusion. So we are trying to jointly analyze data in the form of matrices and higher order tensors. These data sets may have different data distributions. They may have patterns that are shared, but they may also have patterns that are only visible in some of the data sets. And since we're interested in pattern discovery, whatever we do, we're interested in finding those patterns uniquely that will facilitate interpretation. So in this part, we will discuss a flexible algorithmic approach for regularized matrix tensor factorizations with linear couplings. And uh, this will address some of these pro problems, but not all of them. So the second set of challenges is due to uh, the analysis of time evolving data. How can we uh, analyze such data, find the underlying patterns and understand how they change in time? So here we will discuss another tensor factorization model called the Perfect 2 model that we use to trace evolving networks in the data. And we will also discuss a flexible algorithmic approach for that uh, model. And in the last part, we will put these building blocks together to come up with the first version of the model uh, that we intend to use to jointly analyze dynamic and static data sets. So, the, uh, so let's uh, start with the first part where we will discuss this flexible algorithmic approach uh, for jointly analyzing matrices and higher order tensors. This algorithmic approach enables us to incorporate different loss functions, different types of constraints, and also uh, different types of coupling. So as I mentioned before, uh, one, one way to effectively analyze uh, matrices and higher order tensors is to formulate the problem as a coupled factorization problem. So given a higher order tensor coupled with a matrix in the first mode here, we can fit a tensor model. For now, we will uh, only focus on CP, but then uh, towards the end, we will extend this to other tensor methods. So we can fit a tensor model to the tensor, factorize the matrix in such a way that the factor matrix extracted uh, from the coupled mode, which is the first mode here, is the same in both factorizations. So we can formulate this problem as the minimization of the approximation error for the tensor part plus the approximation error for the matrix part. So given X and Y, you want to find all these factor matrices. And this problem has been uh, used successfully uh, in many applications, mainly recommender system applications where the goal is to estimate missing entries, uh, missing links, but not that much in pattern discovery. So if we were to use uh, this formulation when uh, we are analyzing our data sets, this will be the formulation that we have. But here we often have data with different data distributions. And we also want to often incorporate constraints to incorporate prior information or to improve uniqueness. And also here, uh, one issue is that we assume we have the same A extracted from the coupled mode, but in real life, they may be different and they may be related uh, rather than being exactly the same. So rather than this formulation, what we often need is a formulation like this, where we can have different loss functions for different data sets. Uh, we can have constraints here added as a regularization term on some of the factor matrices. Each data has its own factor matrix and they can be related through a coupling relation. So when we look at the literature for the algorithmic approach used to fit uh, coupled matrix tensor factorization based models, the traditional approach is to use alternating least squares based approach and where we can also have constraints and uh, it has been used with linear coupling. Uh, for a while, we worked on all at once optimization methods where we solved this problem uh, for all factor matrices simultaneously using gradient-based approach. Uh, there's also um, Gauss-Newton-based approach in TensorLab, uh, solving the nonlinear least squares problem. But all these methods, uh, they are limited to Frobenius norm or limited in terms of uh, constraints. And when we want to have a flexible modeling framework like this, we also need a flexible algorithmic approach that will uh, facilitate uh, the use of that will uh, that will enable us uh, to incorporate these different loss functions, different constraints, and couplings. So, with this goal, we recently introduced uh, alternating optimization (ADMM) based algorithmic approach uh, for um, 
uh, regularized coupled matrix and tensor factorizations. So this is now the optimization problem we're trying to solve. We are fitting a CP model to the tensor. We are factorizing the matrix. They can be coupled in any mode. Here they are coupled in the D mode. So this is the this D is the mo uh, the uh, the mode of coupling. Uh, I is the index of the data. So uh, here we have two data sets. It can be uh, generalized to more data sets, but here I runs from one to two. We can have constraints in all the the modes here added again as regularization terms. And uh, these. Uh, uh, these are different loss functions, uh, and we need uh, differential losses here. And this is only one type of coupling that we can have. It's for ease of notation, I only included this one, and we will see uh, the different types of couplings that we consider later on. So we solve this using an alternating algorithm where we solve for one mode at a time. So suppose these data sets are coupled in the first mode. So what we do is we fix everything but the, the factor matrices in the first mode. So we are solving this problem with the coupling constraint and constraints on the factor matrices. This is coupled factorization. And we solve this using ADMM, where we have a constraint optimization problem, formulate the augmented Lagrangian, uh, solve for X, solve for Z, uh, Z uh, followed by the dual updates. Now, we use ADMM to approximately solve this subproblem. Once we solve that, then we move on to the other mode with all the other modes fixed and we keep doing this. So each sub problem is solved using ADMM and then we have this alternating uh, between the modes. That's why it's AO ADMM. Now let's take a closer look at the ADMM sub problem. So this is the optimization problem we're trying to solve when we have the data sets coupled in the first mode. So first we introduce as uh, the split variable Z so that we can separate um, the regularization um, regularization from the factorization. And then we add this constraint. And then we formulate this augmented Lagrangian and then we will solve it alternatingly for the, the C factor matrices for the constraint Z. Uh, we will update this coupling matrix and then uh, update the dual variables. So when we have Frobenius norm-based loss functions, these updates of the factor matrices uh, and uh, end up being the solution of a least squares problem uh, mainly, and in one of the cases, it's the solution of a Sylvester equation. If we have different loss functions, differentiable losses, then we use a numerical optimization. For the uh, Z updates, we rely on proximal operators. We update the coupling matrix and then update the dual variables. So I mentioned that we use, uh, we can incorporate different types of coupling. So let's see what, uh, which ones uh, we considered. So this is the, the one, uh, that was originally used in the coupled matrix and tensor factorizations where we have the same factor matrix extracted from, uh, the data set, different data sets. So, uh, this is the exact or hard coupling case. Then we can also have this transformation in the mode dimension. So we can, which will be the case, for instance, if you have data sets with different sampling rates. And then through the transformation matrices, we can map them to a common grid. Or we can have the transformation matrix uh, on the on the other side. And here, basically, the, transform uh, the, the factor matrix or the coupling matrix uh, is multiplied by the transformation matrix uh, from the left. We can also have this transformation matrix in the component dimension, which will be the, which will uh, be used to handle the cases where we have shared unshared factors. So, for instance, in this case, if we multiply the factor matrix with the transformation matrix from the right, then we can uh, indicate which factors are shared, or we can have a dictionary of components. And then through the transformation matrices, uh, we can uh, say which data set has which factors. Okay, so now let's see if this approach works uh, and the whether uh, we perform well in terms of computational time and accuracy compared to the alternative methods out there. So we generate here factor matrices with entries uh, randomly drawn from uniform distribution. And then uh, we use these to construct the, the tensor based on a CP model. We use this to construct the matrix. They are coupled through this exact coupling relation. And then we solve this problem coupled factorization, exact coupling with non-negativity constraints in all modes. And then we get the factor matrices. 
then we can compare the estimated factor matrices with the original ones we used to generate the data. Through this factor match score, it looks complicated, but basically, if it's close to one, uh, it means that we can uh, exactly recover these underlying patterns. So here we compare AOADMM with several different methods, several different algorithms in terms of computational time and also uh, accuracy factor match score. So we compare with CMTF opt, which is the gradient based optimization approach that solves uh, for all factor matrices simultaneously. This is an all at once approach. And then there is TensorLab GN, that's another all at once approach uh, using Gauss Newton uh, based approach. And then we also have an alternating least squares based method here uh, using hierarchical ALS to handle the non negativity constraint. So we have uh, one competing ALS based approach and two. Uh, uh, all at once methods. And you can see here that all the methods are quite accurate, finding the true patterns. And then uh, alternating methods, AOADMM and ALS based approach, they're uh, computationally more efficient than the uh, all at once approach. Now let's have another setting where now we have again two data sets, tensor coupled with a matrix, but now this we have this uh, coupling relation where every other uh, row of this matrix matches with the rows of the, the factor matrix extracted from the other data set. We jointly analyze them with this exact uh, coupling, uh, with, uh, with this uh, linear coupling relation. And then uh, here we compare only with TensorLab uh, because uh, that's the most flexible out there. At least when we did the comparisons, that was the most flexible. Uh, in terms of imposing constraints and linear couplings. And again, both methods are quite accurate. And then AOADMM is uh, computationally more efficient in this case. Now, here is the final setting where we generate data, uh, uh, generate data sets with count data uh, with entries uh, drawn from Poisson distributions. And we have the exact coupling relation. We jointly analyze them. Now, the loss function is KL divergence exact coupling relation and non-negativity constraints in all modes. And uh, you can see the computational time and uh, the accuracy. So when we use KL divergence as a loss function, we can see that we can improve the factor match score compared to uh, Frobenius norm-based uh, loss function. And then we also compare here with uh, what we call split AOADMM KL that's, that was previously used for tensor factorizations and we extended it to couple factorizations, what it does is it introduces an other split variable here. So there is another uh, variable uh, in the loss function. And then the, uh, this um, uh, CP model is uh, added as a constraint. So it has a different way of introducing this different loss function. It's quite efficient. It's slightly less accurate uh, than the AOLDMM based approach. So what we wanted to do here is uh, to have a flexible modeling, a flexible algorithmic approach. And uh, we, we do not want to come up with the most efficient uh, method out there. Uh, we're just trying to make sure that it's accurate and it's also uh, computationally uh, competitive. And uh, the results show that we so far achieved what we are intending for. So we use this uh, framework now to jointly analyze uh, measurements from uh, measurements of mixtures from multiple platforms. Here we have nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy uh, measurements, fluorescence spectroscopy data, uh, and also liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. So NMR and fluorescence data, they are uh, in the form of third order tensors and LCMS is in the form of a matrix and they are all coupled in the, the mixture mode. These mixtures are prepared using five chemicals. And our goal here is by jointly analyzing these measurements from uh, different platforms, uh, we find the underlying patterns, and these underlying patterns will reveal the chemicals in the mixtures. So this is not exactly a real uh, setting uh, where we do not know the mixtures. We actually prepared the mixture, so we know what the patterns should correspond so that we can validate the model. Uh, but in the ideal setting, you will have, for instance, as mixtures, blood samples, and then you will find underlying patterns and those patterns, you will try to match them with the, uh, the chemicals. So here we are modeling uh, NMR uh, with CP, fitting a CP model to the NMR data, fitting a CP model to the fluorescence data, and then jointly fa factorizing the LCMS. 
we expect all factor matrices to be non-negative. And then we have this coupling relation. And then this relation shows the shared and unshared factors in the data sets. So let's say we have all the patterns matching to some to different chemicals. So uh, we will have all the chem the set of all chemicals, but not all chemicals will show up in every platform. So some uh, measure, uh, some chemicals, for instance, all three chemicals, they show up in all the platforms. But then this fourth one is only uh, visible in LCMS and NMR, and it's the last one is only visible in NMR. So this through this uh, coupling relation, we indicate the shared unshared factors. For now, we assume that we have we have this information, the transformation matrices. And there are the ways to learn these transformation matrices, but ideally we should be able to learn it from the data, but we haven't done that yet. Okay, so when we fit this model using AOADMM, these are the factor matrices corresponding to the mixture mode. So when we get this factor matrix from the mixture mode, what we have is a mixture by the number of components. And each column of this matrix will reveal the relative concentration of the chemical in the mixtures. So we have here five components and uh, so corresponding to five chemicals. And we know the true design of the experiment. So those are the, uh, the, the ground truth is here plotted in, okay, the, the dark blue in each plot corresponds to the true design of the experiment. And then here, what is captured in red is what is captured by the model. So this model, can capture three of the components uh, from the fluorescence data. And then we see all the chemicals in NMR. And then in LCMS, we see four of them. And then in LCMS, we actually allow for another component because we expect structured noise in the LCMS data. Okay, so, uh, so, so far we have uh, been discussing uh, the issues um, related to data fusion, how to jointly analyze data sets. Now let's move on to the second part where we will try to see how we can analyze time evolving data to capture evolving patterns in an interpretable way. So in this part, we will discuss using PERFECT2 uh, to uh, find the evolving patterns uh, in time evolving data. And we will also introduce an AOADMM based algorithmic framework again for fitting the PERFECT2 model in a flexible way so that we can impose constraints. So this is uh, the main. Uh, this is the the main focus of uh, Marie's PhD thesis, uh, and uh, this is joint work with Carla, Wins, Tulai, Rasmus, and Jeremy. So when we have time evolving data sets, uh, we can often represent it as a higher order tensor with one of the modes corresponding to time. For instance, if we have a fMRI data collected during a task, we can arrange that as a subject by voxel by time tensor. And here we're interested in finding the spatial patterns in the voxel mode, and we want to understand how they change in time. So we're interested in capturing the spatial dynamics. If we were to use the CP model to analyze this data, we will get these rank one components. So let's say this is a uh, modeling one brain activity, and then we see the spatial pattern related to that. And then the temporal signature, and then we will get the subject coefficients. Now this, this model does not allow the spatial network or the spatial pattern to change in time. It only allows it to be scaled up and down with the coefficient um, here, but uh, that's the only change allowed. So it has the same pattern in every time slice. So the same B matrix in every time slice. But what we are interested in is uh, having different spatial patterns in different time slices so they can uh, change. So rather than having the same B matrix, we want to have these BKs changing with every time slice K. And since this model, uh, this one that we have here reminded us another tensor factorization model called the perfect two model, we looked into uh, whether we can use this model to reveal evolving patterns. And together with this constant cross product constraint that I will keep referring to as the perfect two constraint, uh, this model has shown to be unique. So we, we looked at the performance of this model on simulated data where uh, we had evolving networks and we used the model to find the underlying patterns, underlying uh, networks and how they change in time and it performs um, well on simulated data. What I want to show here 
is an application of this model um, where we used uh, Perfect2 uh, to analyze fMRI data collected during a test. So here we have uh, subjects uh, performing a sensory motor task. Uh, so they here, we also heard about this uh, task before in uh, Tilly's talk. So they, uh, they hear increasing and decreasing pitch and every time they hear a tone, they're asked to press the button. And we have uh, over 250 subjects. Some of them are healthy controls. Some of them are patients with schizophrenia. Now this, this task um, is, uh, so they, in, uh, they hear increasing, decreasing pitch. They press the button and they repeat this. So this is for 16 seconds. Uh, then there is, this is followed by a rest period. Uh, so we arrange this data as a subject by voxel by time window tensor where each time window corresponds to either a task or a rest. Uh, part. Now we model the data using a perfect two uh, model and get these uh, two components. Here, one of the components uh, turns out to be statistically significant in terms of group difference. And what we get from the component is in the voxel mode, these evolving spatial patterns. So here, what you see as changing, so one image is one uh, pattern, uh, one vector, and this vector is changing in time. We haven't yet quantified the change, but so far we are happy that these things are changing. And then in the time mode, what we see is the task rest pattern that we see uh, that we have in the, the data. So, so far it's nice in the sense that we see the evolving patterns and these patterns seem to make sense in terms of the areas of activation uh, expected to be engaged during the task and differ between the groups. But one issue that we had here is that these, these patterns are noisier than expected. So then we want to impose some constraints, for instance, to impose spatial smoothness so that we can make these uh, patterns more uh, interpretable. But that's not that easy uh, with the Perfect2 model, and let's see why. So when we fit a Perfect2 model, we are solving this optimization problem. So this is the, the data fitting term, and this is the constraint that we have, uh, the constant cross product constraint. And uh, the traditional approach is to solve this problem using ALS-based algorithm, uh, where we can actually replace this constraint reformulated in this form. So BK becomes PK times B, where the PKs have orthonormal columns. So if you actually put BK, uh, replace BKs with this, rather than solving this problem, you can solve this problem. And this problem can be solved uh, where we uh, easily, where we have a um, uh, closed form solution for the PK. And then once we have the PK, we can multiply these slices with the PK, and this ends up being a CP model that we already saw before. So, and then we get the updates for ABC. So we can impose now constraints on ABC, but if we impose constraints on B, it's not necessarily the constraints that we will end up having on the B case because BK is PK times B trans B. So that's uh, if we use this algorithmic approach, uh, it has been a challenge uh, to impose constraints and often it's used without any constraints on uh, on BKs. So what we do here is in order to have this flexibility where we can add uh, constraints that will imp in improve interpretability, uh, we formulate perfect model uh, in this form. By, uh, we fit the model by solving this optimization problem. So this is again the data fitting term. We can have constraints in all the modes. And we also have this additional constraint saying that uh, the BKs should satisfy the perfect two constraints. So they should uh, be in the set uh, of BKs following, uh, satisfying this constraint. We solve this problem again using an alternating method. We solve for uh, the B uh, and then the other mode and all the other modes in an alternating fashion. The interesting part here is the BK updates where we use ADMM. So we again uh, separate uh, the constraints from the factorization by introducing these variables. So we have the constraint and the, the perfect two constraint. And uh, in the ADMM iteration, what we are doing is we are updating the BK. Uh, this would be a least squares, uh, uh, the solution of a least squares problem. Uh, we will use, uh, depending on the constraint that we have, we can use a proximal operator and then 
we project this uh, BKs onto the set that satisfy this constraint, and we have an approximation for that. So we find the PK and delta. This delta is the B on the previous slide, but now we we try to find these BKs that uh, that that's as close uh, as possible to the um, uh, the BK satisfying the perfect two constraint. So this would be the ADMM subproblem again. And then uh, we, since we're alternating, it's again AOADMM. And you can have ADMM updates also for these other modes. Now, let's see how this approach works. So again, we have here uh, some simulation experiment, uh, simulated data, um, and then uh, some real applications. So we generate here A, B, and C with non-negative factor matrices. Bs also satisfy the perfect two constraint. We construct a tensor. And then we fit a perfect two model. Here we fit the perfect two model uh, with non-negativity constraints with all modes when we use AOA DMM. If we use ALS, then it has only non-negativity in A and C. And uh, there is also another approach that's called this perfect two with flexible coupling, uh, where the perfect two constraint here is added as a penalty term. And uh, this is uh, this has been used with non-negativity constraints, and we, that's what we call uh, HALS here uh, because it's using hierarchical ALS for the, uh, the non-negative least scores problem. So we also compare with this uh, method uh, where it's possible to impose non-negativity in all the modes. So what we see here is if we impose constraints in all the modes, this is again the factor match score, uh, both HALS and AOADMM, uh, they're doing well. ALS is less accurate because uh, it cannot impose non-negativity constraints when the underlying patterns are non-negative. And then AOA DMM is more efficient uh, in terms of computational uh, time uh, than the, uh, this uh, perfect two with flexible coupling approach. So to show the flexibility of the, the algorithmic approach here, we also have a, a case where we have non-negative factor matrices, but we also have this unimodal unimodal columns in the BKs. And uh, in this case, BKs approximately satisfy the perfect two structure because in real life, we do not expect that this uh, constant cross product constraint will be satisfied. So we want to see the performance of the, the algorithm uh, in such a case. And then we look at the performance of again, different approach where ALS it's easier to see from the factor max scores, but this is the, the patterns in the, uh, the first mode A, these are the BKs, and then these are the, the patterns in the third mode. And um, we use ALS where we can have constraints in A and C, non-negativity, hierarchical ALS with non-negativity constraints in all the modes, non-negativity uh, with AOA DMM, and if we also add non-negativity and unimodality, which is the underlying structure in the data, then uh, the highest FMS score is achieved. And from the patterns, it's the one that's matching the underlying patterns most accurately. So we, so now we use this approach to uh, analyze um, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry measurements of wine samples, uh, where we fit a perfect two model with non-negativity constraints in all modes. So the data is in the form of a mass spectra, elution time and sample tensor. Uh, and we fit a perfect two model, first with ALS to see what happens if we do not impose non-negativity constraints in the, in the BK. So we expect that all these factor matrices will be non-negative. And then we compare with what we get with AOADMM with non-negativity constraints in all modes. So let's look at the first component. So in this one, we see a column of the A matrix, and here we see a column of the B, columns of different Bs, and then they are scaled also with the, the sample coefficient. And what, so since we do not have no negativity constraint, it's, this one is difficult to interpret because we see unrealistic uh, non-negative uh, negative parts and also multiple peaks showing up together. But if we use non-negativity, then uh, we have a single peak and uh, also all non-negative, which is uh, much easier to interpret. So through the constraints, we can improve the interpretation. Now let's also go back to the uh, neuroscience application where we had task of MRI data and we were interested in using Perfect2 to uh, trace spatial dynamics. 
So when we use the ALS-based approach, we have these spatial patterns that were noisy, and we wanted to impose spatial smoothness, but due to ALS, we couldn't. So now we, through the AOADMM-based approach, uh, we incorporate spatial smoothness uh, by using this graph uh, Laplacian-based regularizer, uh, which uh, basically penalizes the difference uh, between neighboring uh, voxels. Uh, this is just for il illustration, the neighboring in the sense, uh, in, neighboring in 3D, uh, not like this. And then uh, this is what we get using ALS. These are two components. So let's look at the first one that was more uh, meaningful. So this is what we get with ALS, and this is what we get with AOADMM with spatial smoothness. So we see now more uh, smoother patterns. It's not a groundbreaking improvement, but it just imp uh, it just helps the interpretation a little bit, and it also shows that this regularization works. Okay, now uh, let's move on to the last part where we will put these two. Uh, just, uh, just to let you know, we have about four minutes left, so. Yes. Okay. I have, I just need four minutes. That's fine. Uh, so then, uh, we will discuss how we can come up with a model that we can use to jointly analyze dynamic and static data sets. So this is joint work with Carla and Schilling. Uh, we are here embedding the perfect two model into the regularized coupled matrix and tensor factorization framework. Um, so we have a matrix factorization. We have the perfect two, uh, used to model the tensor with the perfect two constraints. And we can also have the uh, linear couplings that we discussed, and we can have constraints in all the factor matrices. And we solve it here using a AO ADMM. Perfect 2 has previously been used in coupled factorizations, uh, for instance, in temporal phenot phenotyping applications, and also to jointly analyze EEG and fMRI data. But uh, in those cases, uh, the methods were limited in terms of constraints and linear coupling. So with this last example, I will uh, just show why we are trying to jointly analyze dynamic and static data sets. So let's say we have this X matrix, X tensor, uh, which is um, a dynamic data set, and it has this blurry clustering structure. And it also has these evolving BK. So we have here uh, three rows in the Bs and uh, three components, and then they change in time. So these uh, show the changing networks in a way. And in this X, remember we have this blurry cluster. And then we have another data set, that's Y, uh, constructed using E and F, uh, where E has a very clean cluster structure. So now we jointly analyze these data sets using uh, perfect two-based couple matrix and tensor factorizations with uh, this exact coupling relation. Now, if you look at the results, even though the dynamic data, so that could be our metabolomics data, even though it has a blurry clustering structure, we will end up getting a cleaner cluster structure through the data fusion. And the factor match scores here show that we still get the evolving patterns accurately. But if we were to analyze the metabolomics data or the dynamic data just by itself, then uh, the factor match scores in parentheses here show that uh, they do not well, uh, match well with the clean cluster structure. OK, so basically, uh, in summary, we're trying to extract insights from uh, complex data data sets. These data sets are often uh, collected from different sources. They are some of them time evolving, some of them are static. And um, our, uh, we, we rely on tensor factorizations uh, when analyzing these data sets because tensors have uh, tensor factorizations have been quite effective in terms of revealing interpretable patterns from uh, data in different disciplines. And we have discussed a flexible data fusion framework based on coupled matrix and tensor factorizations uh, that enables us to incorporate constraints, the different types of coupling, loss functions, and also evolving patterns. So, so nowadays we're trying to make these methods time aware. Even though I keep saying time evolving, we still have not incorporated time. Uh, and then uh, we are also trying to analyze these dynamic metabolomics measurements with the additional sources that we have. So thank you for your interest. This concludes my talk. These are the references of some related uh, for some related papers. We have the software. And if you are interested in uh, the ongoing work on data fusion, you can check out the Tracer webpage. Thank you so much. <laughs>